Hey guys, welcome to this video on projectile motion. In this video, I'll be talking through all uh, the knowledge you need for level 2 mechanics for the projectile motion section in the mechanics exam. So, first of all, the basic idea of um, projectile motion it actually involves an object that is being traveling in a parabolic shape after um, a force has been applied on it. So you can apply this into real life by thinking about if you're kicking a soccer ball, for example, if first of all, you're going to notice it's going to travel upwards and then after some time, it's going to hit a maximum height where you, you, you don't really see this in real life, but actually stops temporarily, like a split second, it will stop at the maximum height and then it will travel back down again. So in this topic, we will be combining the knowledge of horizontal movement and vertical movement on an object. So uh, I trust that uh, in class, you would have already studied um, vertical motion by itself and horizontal motion by itself. But in the projectile motion, we will be combining both of these knowledge into one scenario. Okay, so one important thing to note is that when you're dealing with projectile motion, uh, the horizontal component and the vertical component is treated separately. So for example, you cannot find a horizontal distance using a vertical um, component. And vice versa, you cannot, you cannot uh, use a vertical component to find a horizontal distance. So if you're trying to find a vertical distance, you're only going to use the vertical component. And if you want to find a horizontal distance or a horizontal velocity, you're only going to find the horizontal component. All right, so uh, yeah, imagine kicking a so soccer ball upwards. It travels to a max height, stops for a split second, and then travels down again. And it's going to land. Okay, so in, in level two physics, we will neglect the effect of air resistance. So in real life, when you're kicking the ball, there's actually going to be um, the air particles is actually going to have an effect on the ball. But for the uh, sake of sim simplicity in level two, we're actually going to pretend that doesn't exist. We're just going to say that the effect is too small, that it's going to be negligible. So the only unbalanced force that's acting on the object during the motion is actually the force of gravity. So all you need to know right now is that the unbalanced force on the ball is going to be equal to the force of gravity and we know that that acts downwards and the magnitude of the force of gravity on the surface of the earth is 9.8 meters per second per second downwards. Alright, so now we're going to look at the horizontal component and the vertical component of, um, of the velocity. Alright, in physics, there are many different um, scenarios where a horizontal and vertical component of a vector can be applied. Uh, it relies on the idea that if there is a vector acting at an angle to a horizontal or a vertical, then it will always have its vertical and horizontal component. So take for example, if we had um, a vector that's acting 100 newtons at an angle, it's always going to have a horizontal and a a horizontal and a vertical component. So this can be applied to, for example, like a scenario where you might have a tension force, a string, and if you have a string with a tension force acting at an angle, it's going to have a horizontal and a vertical component. Yeah, so as you can see, the vertical and horizontal component. And in this case, we have um, we have a simple Pythagoras. We can say that a squared plus b squared equals a c squared. So in this case, we can say that the, the magnitude of the vertical component squared plus the magnitude of the horizontal component squared will be equal to 100 squared in this specific scenario. And in this case, because it's a right angle triangle, trig rules will apply. Uh, yeah, this is only for, remember when you're applying Pythagoras, that is only for um, right angle triangles. Um, normally in level 2, you should only be dealing with right angle triangles, but uh, in level 3, there will be some, there could be some scenarios where you're not dealing with um, uh, right angle triangles. So it's important to um, note that it's not always going to be a right angle triangle. But, but generally, generally for level 2, you should be getting um, uh, right angle triangles. Alright, so how does this apply in projectile motion? So when an object is traveling in a projectile motion, it has a vertical and horizontal component of velocity. Alright, so for example, when you're kicking a ball, you're going to be kicking the ball at an angle. You're not going to be, if you're kicking the ball horizontally, then it's just going to move horizontally, it's not going to move vertically. But in this case, you're going to be kicking it at an angle, so you're going to have, it's going to have an instantaneous velocity at an angle. So that instantaneous velocity is going to be made up of the vertical component and the horizontal component. So uh, the horizontal component stays constant because there are no horizontal unbalanced forces. Okay, so uh, as we were saying before, the air resistance, we're taking that as negligible. So we're going to pretend that that's the, we're going to say that it's too small to have an effect, so we're not going to consider it. Therefore, there are actually no horizontal unbalanced forces. And according to Newton's fir uh, first law, 
If there are no uh, unbalanced forces on an object, then it's going to continue in its state of motion. So in this case, the, the horizontal component is always going to be the same throughout the whole flight time of the object. All right, the vertical component will change throughout the motion. And uh, for these den denotations, uh, Vx, Vy, you can also call them, uh, your teacher might have told you Vh or Vy, uh, sorry, Vh or um, v Vv. It's like there's many different ways you can denote it. As long as you make it clear to the marker um, how you're going to denote your um, velocities, then it's okay. okay. So the vertical component will change throughout the motion. The reason for this is because there's an unbalanced force of gravity on the object. And once again, bringing it back to Newton's first law, if there's an unbalanced force on the object, then the state of motion will change because there's that unbalanced force. So as you can see here, this is the vector diagram. So we're going to have an instantaneous velocity represented by the black arrow. And that instantaneous velocity is going to be acting at an angle, that angle of the horizontal in this case. And it's going to be made up of the vertical component and the uh, horizontal component. All right, so where V is the instantaneous velocity of the object and theta is the angle from the horizontal component. All right, so now we're going to be calculating the horizontal and vertical component. So uh, in level two physics, you'll be given an object moving at velocity V and the angle theta from the horizontal. Uh, you should use trigonometry rules to determine the horizontal and vertical components of the object. And like I said before, this is because it is a right angle triangle. So once again, I have the same image from the last slide. Okay, so in this case, if you can see that um, our Vx is actually equal to cos theta times V. So our, v, uh, our Vx is our adjacent side, and normally that will give you the instantaneous velocity. So your Vx will be equal to cos theta times V. So the cos is adjacent over hypotenuse. Similarly, uh, our Vy would be sine theta, times, sine theta times our instantaneous velocities because that's the opposite side of the angle. So sine, sine is uh, O of it opposite over hypotenuse. All right, so here are a few practice questions. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so for this question, I want you to find the vertical component and the horizontal component, given the instantaneous velocity is 15 meters per second and the angle is angle from the horizontal is 20 degrees. So pause the video now and um, try to figure it out. And then when you're done, continue watching the video. Okay, I hope you finished uh, finished with this question. And our vertical component would be equal to sine 20 times 15. So remember to set your calculator onto degrees. Very important. Uh, lots of people uh, sometimes forget to, because when they reset your calculator, your uh, calculator goes back to radians. And some people forget to change it back to degrees, so they make real, uh, they get all the incorrect answers. So remember when they, when they reset your calculator in the exam, you always set it back to degrees because um, because everything in the projectile motion will be given to you in degrees. So in this case, uh, sine 20 times 15 is equal to our Vy. So our Vy is 5.13 meters per second. Uh, Vx would be equal to cos 20 times 15, which would be 14.1 meters per second. All right, so another practice question. Uh, this time, this time we're given the horizontal velocity is a horizontal component is 10 meters per second and our angle from the horizontal is 30 degrees so i want you to find the instantaneous velocity as well as the vertical component so just be careful with your trig rules okay so remember which trig rules to use cos sine and tan and pause the video now and when you're ready keep watching okay i hope you're done with that question so i'll <clears throat> Our Vy in this case will actually be equal to um, sorry, 10, 30 times 10 because, that, because we have our 30 degrees. Our Vy is our opposite side and the side we're given 10 meters per second is the adjacent. So 10 is O over A. So therefore, 10, 30 times 10 equals to Vy, which is 5.77 meters per second. So now that after that you find your Vy, you can, um, you can now find your instantaneous velocity. However, you can also use the rule of uh, the cos rule to find our, uh, our instantaneous velocity, or you can use the value you just calculated, which is 5.77. All right, so by applying Pythagoras, v squared equals to 10 squared plus 5.77 squared, and you should get that your instantaneous velocity is 11.55 meters per second. 
so hopefully that wasn't anything new and hopefully you're very comfortable with um, finding the missing components because in level two projectile motion that's going to be a very key question that comes up every year and it's like I can guarantee you it's going to come up every year <clears throat> it's going to ask you to find the a component using trig rules okay so it's important that you understand how to do this because it's the very basic building blocks that we need in order to move on with the topic. All right, so now we have our equations of motions and the relevance to projectile motion. So if you recall back, your teacher may have told you the four equations of motions. So the four equations of motion is that final velocity equals to initial velocity times acceleration multiplied by time. Okay, you can read those by yourself, but you should have covered this uh, four equations of motions in class. All right, so with the equations of motion in, pro uh, in projectile motion, once again, I said this in the very first slide, I'm gonna say it again. It is important to consider the vertical and horizontal components separately. <clears throat> yeah, for example, if you're trying to find a vertical max height, you will use the VY component as the initial velocity and not the VX, because it doesn't make sense to calculate max height with a horizontal velocity. All right, some important notes. So acceleration of gravity is a vertical force. We do not consider it in the horizontal plane. So for gravity, we're only going to consider it as a vertical force. We do not consider it as a horizontal force at all. All right, so some, an important point to notice is that gravity is negative 9.8 meters per second per second when the ball is traveling upwards. This is because when we first, for example, when we first kick a ball, uh, the gravity, the ball is going to be traveling upwards while the gravity is going to be acting downwards. They're acting in opposite directions. So if we take VY, uh, VY as positive, then the gravity has to be negative because it's an opposite direction. However, after the ball reaches its max height and starts uh, falling back downwards again, when it moves downwards, it's in the same direction as the gravity. They're both traveling downwards. Therefore, we're going to both consider both of them as positive. <clears throat> Yeah, both of them as positive. So gravity would be positive 9.8 meters per second per second when the ball is traveling down. All right, so <clears throat> the next part is uh, finding the time to the maximum height. So how long will it take for an object to reach its maximum height? So considering, an, uh, let's consider a object. It has, for example, this is a soccer ball. It has been kicked at uh, 30 meters per second at an angle of 40 degrees to the horizontal. All right, so the max height refers to a vertical component. So height is vertical, not horizontal. So therefore, we should only be considering the vertical component of the velocity. <clears throat> so at the max height, the final vertical velocity is zero because uh, when it's, sorry. At the max height, the final vertical velocity is zero. This is because the ball will stop momentarily, be stationary at the top, well, vertically stationary at the top. It was, it's because the horizontal component stays the same, it's still going to be moving horizontally. However, in the vertical plane, it's going to be stationary. And that's because of the gravity force that has been acting on the ball. It has slowed the ball down to zero. And then after the max height, it's going to, the ball is going to start accelerating downwards. So when the when the vertical velocity is zero, that is when the ball is at its maximum height because that is the highest it can go because any time after that, it's going to start falling down. So it's going to no longer be the max height. And any, any time before the max height, it's still going to be moving up. So that's not the max height either. So the max height would be that exact moment where that vertical velocity is zero. All right, so for, for this specific question, okay, we will need to consider the vertical velocity. So using our trig rules, we can say that sine 40 times 13 is equal to our Vy, which is 8.36 meters per second. So we can use our equations of motions. We can use that Vf equals to Vi plus At. So our initial, our initial velocity is equal to our initial Vy in this case, because once again, we're considering the vertical plane, not the horizontal plane. So that our initial velocity is 8.36 meters per second, and our acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second per second. And we know that our final velocity is going to be momentarily stopping, though vertically it's going to be stationary at the maximum height. So our final velocity is zero. So rearranging the equation, we should find that our time is 0 0.85 seconds. Therefore, the ball takes 0 0.85 seconds to reach the max height. So an important thing to note is uh, in level two, we're going to be considering the parabola as symmetrical. So the first part of the, so the first part of the flight will be exactly the same. Well, not exactly the same, but it's going to be the opposite. 
to the second half. So if it takes 0 0.85 seconds to reach max height, it's going to take 0 0.85 seconds to from the max height to reach back to the ground, so as it's symmetrical. Therefore, the total flight time, we can conclude that is 0 0.85 times 2, which is 1.7 seconds. Alright, so max height. Alright, so by knowing how to calculate the time to max height, we have enough information to work out the maximum height of the projectile. It's important to note that in reality, the ball will not actually reach its height due to external forces that cannot be considered, like, such as um, air resistance and other small, like for example, like wind might have an effect on the ball. However, we're not considering that due to simplicity. All right, there are two main ways we can calculate the max height. So we can either use our equations of motion as d equals to vi plus vf over 2 multiplied by the time. So this, me this method only works if you already uh, have the time to the max height. So once you've calculated the time to the max height, you can use the time that you calculated and substitute into this formula to find your distance, to, uh, distance at the max height. Alternatively, you can use vf squared equals to vi squared plus 2ad. What's good about this formula is actually uh, that you do not need to calculate the time to max height. So you can do it with only the um, vf, vi, and acceleration. You do not need the max height, the time to max height, as you do in the d equals to vi plus vf over 2 times of time formula. So this is the easiest way to do it because you do not need to, once, like I said, you don't need to calculate the time to max height. Alright, so we'll be finding the time to max height. For this example, we have a ball that is 40 degrees from the horizontal and is traveling at 13 meters per second. The instantaneous velocity is 13 meters per second. So uh, I want you to pause the video and try to find the max height by yourself. Okay, I hope you found the max height. And what I've got here is, well, this is the previous example. So we're going to be using the formula that Vf squared equals to Vi squared plus 2AD. We're going to substitute that our Vf is 0 meters per second. Uh, our acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second per second. And our Vi is 8.36 meters per second. So if we substitute these numbers in, we should get that our distance is 3.57 meters. So the maximum height the ball reaches is 3.57 meters. I hope you got that answer when you were trying to figure out the question. <clears throat> if not, you should uh, review. Okay, example number two. All right, a ball kicked at the velocity of 28 meters per second at an angle of 35 degrees to the horizontal. Calculate the time to max height and the max height. All right, so I've got the diagram here. Oh, sorry. Okay, so I want you to pause the video and I want you to find the time to max height and the max height. Okay, so what I've got here, so we need to find out our vertical component, which in this case would be sine 35 times 28, which is equal to 16.06 .06 meters per second. And we're going to be using our equations of motions, which is VR, VF equals to VI plus AT to find our time to max height. So if you substitute, once again, we substitute our VF is 0 meters per second. Our VI is our initial vertical component, which is 16.06 .06 meters per second. And our acceleration would be negative 9.8 meters per second per second. So if we substitute these numbers in, we should get that our time it takes to reach the max height is 1.64 seconds. For the max height, we can use our VF squared equals to VI squared plus 2AD. Uh, I strongly suggest that in the exam, if they ask you to find both of these, I strongly suggest that you still use Vf squared equals to Vi squared plus 2AD, even if you did find the time to the max height. The way for this is that if you did make a mistake in the first part of the question, you do not follow through and make another mistake using an incorrect value you calculated. So for example, let's say that 1.64 seconds was incorrect. If I had used that in, in a following calculation, I will also get another incorrect answer and I will be penalized both times. So it's really good to use um, a the VF squared equals to VI squared plus 2AD because it does not require any like any max the time to max height. So therefore there's less chance of you making uh you, you there's less chance of you to lose marks on the question. So in this case, if we substitute our numbers in, we should get that our distance is um 13.16 meters. Alright, so uh example three. So we need to also learn how to work backwards. So this time we're going to be given the time to max height and we want to find an initial vertical component. So in this case, a ball takes 3 seconds to reach max height and the max height... Um, sorry, it should... Mm, don't know... Hmm... 
apologies for that. <laughs> right, so a ball takes three seconds to reach the max height, and we want to find the max height and the initial vertical component. So here's our little diagram. So we want to find the VY and the max height reached. Okay, so pause the video now. I want you to try this by yourself. Okay, I hope you've tried to figure the question out by yourself. So what I've got here is that uh, VF equals to VI plus AT. In this case, um, in this case, we're going to be working backwards. So we do not know the VI, but we do know how long it takes to reach the max height. So we know that our T is three seconds acceleration because once again, the VI is moving in the opposite direction as the force of gravity is downwards, VI is upwards. Therefore, we consider gravity as negative 9.8. And once again, our VF will be zero meters per second at the maximum height. So in this case, if we rearrange our formula, we should get that our VI is equal to 29.4 meters per second. So now we can use another equation of motion. So D equals to VI plus VF over two multiplied by time in order to find our distance. So in this case, we know that our time is three seconds. We know that our VI is 29.4 meters per second and our VF is zero meters per second. So substituting those numbers in, we should get that our distance, distance at max height is 44.1 meters. Uh, meters. Alright, so this is a, a challenge for, uh, for anyone that's interested. So the challenge is to derive a formula for the max height, given that the initial velocity is v and the angle to the horizontal is theta. Yeah, I'm confident that this is scholarship level because I have seen uh, the same question in a scholarship uh, exam. So you, you, uh, for further clarifications, you do not need this for level two. It's just for those who are willing to extend themselves. All right. So I want you for those who are interested. I want you to try this for yourself. All right. So what I've got here is that uh, if, once again we need to find out in terms of our vy because we're trying to find the maximum height. So in this case, v sine theta equals to vy. So we're going to be using our equation Vs squared equals to Vi squared plus 2AD in order to find our maximum height. So in this case, our Vi would be our V sine theta, which is our Vy. So therefore, V sine theta squared, so V squared sine squared theta, uh, plus 2AD, but in this case, uh, A is negative 9.8, and we're trying to find our distance. So if we rearrange the equation, we should get that V squared sine squared theta divided by 2 times of 9.8 equals to D. And that is a formula for the maximum height in terms of the instantaneous velocity and the horizontal and the um, angle theta the from the horizontal. Alright, so horizontal range, or in other words, the horizontal distance traveled. We know that the horizontal velocity stays constant as there are no unbalanced horizontal forces. Hence, the total horizontal range distance will be the total time of the flight multiplied by the horizontal velocity. So because the horizontal uh, velocity does not change, we can use our formula that d equals to vt in order to find our horizontal distance. So in this case, for example, if we had a, the same example, so 40 degrees from the horizontal and 13 meters per second is the instantaneous, instantaneous velocity, we can use this information to work out the range, <clears throat> the total range that the object travels. So in the previous question, we found that the total flight time of the of the object is three point seven seconds. So in this case, we're going to be using the trying to find the horizontal component because we're considering a horizontal distance. So cos forty times thirteen is equal to our horizontal component. Our horizontal component is equal to nine point nine six meters per second. Therefore, our range equals to VH times total time, which in this case would be 36.85 meters. So basically, if you're trying to find a horizontal range, always find the horizontal component and then the total flight time of the ball. Or not necessarily a ball, but the total flight time of, an, of the object. So how do you find the horizontal, um, sorry, not horizontal, how do you find the total flight time? So remember, I was saying that the parabola is symmetrical, so therefore you can find the time it takes to reach the max height and then multiply it by 2 in order to find the total flight time. And you use that total flight time to multiply it with the horizontal component, and you will get the total distance traveled by the object. Alright, so example 2. Given that the velocity of a ball kicked at an angle of 50 degrees to the horizontal is 34 meters per second, calculate the horizontal range traveled. 
So here's the vector diagram. We have a 50 degrees from the horizontal and 35 meters per second is the instantaneous velocity. So I want you to try this question by yourself and pause the video. <coughs> pause the video. All right, I hope you finished with the question. So what I've got here is that um, our Vy is equal to 35 times sine 50. So our Vy is equal to 26.812 meters per second. Uh, our Vx would be 35 times cos 50, which is 22.498 meters per second. All right, so now we need to find the time to max height. So we're going to be using our v, Vf equals to Vi plus At formula. So if we rearrange the formula, we'll get that our t equals to 2.736 seconds. Because the parabola is symmetrical, our total time taken will be two times of the time, which the total time would be 5.472 seconds. So now we can simply multiply the horizontal component with the total time in order to find the total distance traveled. So in this case, 5.472 times of 22.498 22 is equal to 123.11 meters. And that is our horizontal range. Example three. Okay, so again, uh, like a previous question, we need to understand how to work backwards. So given the horizontal range is 100 meters, uh, and this was traveled in five seconds of total flight time, calculate the initial vertical velocity as well as the horizontal velocity, and hence determine the initial velocity the ball was kicked at. So the initial velocity as in the instantaneous velocity the ball was kicked at. So once again, I want you to pause the video and try this question out for yourself. Okay, so what I've got here is... <clears throat> Okay, so we know that our Vx is equal to our range um, divided by our total time because we know that range equals to Vx times total time. So if we rearrange the formula, if we divide by total times on both sides, we'll get range divided by total time equals to Vx. So 100 divided by 5, which means that the horizontal component must be 20 meters per second. Okay, so for the vertical component, we can use that uh, half, the time, half the total flight time is the time to the maximum height because once again, the, the parabola is symmetrical. So half of 5 is 2.5 seconds, and we can use our Vf equals to Vi plus At formula in order to find out our in, in <coughs> initial vertical component. So we should get that our initial vertical component is 24.5 meters per second, and now we can apply our Pythagoras theorem in order to find out our... Uh, instantaneous velocity. So in this case, v squared equals to vx squared plus vy squared, and we should get that our v equals to 31.63 meters per second. So that's just the Pythagoras rule. So in this case, 24.5 squared plus 20 squared, and then the square root of the sum, and you should get 31.63 meters per second as your instantaneous velocity. Alright, so I have another verbal challenge, and this is again a scholarship level question. If you're not willing to do to attempt this question, then you can just move on, just skip ahead in the video. But for those who are interested and willing to have an extra go, here's another challenge. So derive a formula for when an object is traveling at uh, a v velocity at the angle theta to the horizontal. So given that uh, given the trig identity that two sine theta cos theta equals to two theta. So I want you to try this question by yourself. For those who are interested. Okay, so what I've got here is that uh, once again we have our v sine theta is equal to our vy. So in this case we want to try to find the total time taken and for that to happen we need to find our uh, time to maximum height and then multiply by 2 to find our total time. So vf equals to vi plus at and once again we know for the things we do know is that the final, final vertical velocity is 0 while the acceleration of gravity is 9.8, but negative 9.8 in this situation because once again, the vertical velocity is acting in the opposite direction as the force of gravity. So in this case, if we rearrange the equation, uh, we have our V, okay, so we have our VI is equal to V sine theta, and if we rearrange the formula, we should get that V sine theta divided by 9.8 is equal to T. However, this T is the time to the maximum height, so in order to find the time for the whole flight, we need to multiply everything by 2. So therefore, 2t equals to 2v sine theta over 9.8. So now that we have our total time, we can now find our 
horizontal component and then multiply the two to get our range. So we know that v cos theta equals to vx. So if we multiply v cos theta and uh, our total time, we should get our range. So 2v sine theta divided by 9.8 times v cos theta is equal to our range. So, however, we are, we are told that sine theta cos theta, 2 sine theta cos theta equals to 2... Okay, sorry guys. <clears throat> so 2 sine theta cos theta equals to sine 2 theta. So we have 2v sine theta cos... 2v... Okay, sorry guys. Okay. 2v sine theta v cos theta. So we can combine... 2 sine theta cos theta and substitute that in for sine 2 theta instead. So we have our so we have our final range is v squared sine 2 theta divided by 9.8. So I apologize for the stuttering there. Alright, so we need to be uh, so now we're going to be covering how to give a description of the horizontal component and the vertical component during the uh, during the para parabolic motion, the projectile motion. So in NCA, a common, a common merit level question is asking to describe the changes to the VH and VY throughout the course of the flight. Okay, so the important things you have to mention is that the only unbalanced force is gravity as air resistance is negligible. So because air resistance is negligible, that means there are no horizontal, um, there are no unbalanced horizontal forces, which means that the VH will remain constant throughout the entire flight. So it's important that this is very important that you mention that the VH is constant because there are no unbalanced horizontal forces. Okay, so then you can move on to your VY. You can say that your VY is always changing because of the force of gravity that is acting on the object. The force of gravity is an external unbalanced force, and according to Newton's first law, this will, this will cause a change in the motion. So in the first half of the flight, the vertical component acts in the opposite direction as the force of gravity, which means that because they're acting in the opposite directions, the VY will begin to decrease over time. And once it decreases over time, it's going to become, at a certain stage in time, it's going to be zero meters per second, and that occurs at the maximum height. As the ball is at the maximum height, the ball is then going to accelerate downwards due to the force of gravity, and in that case, the <clears throat> in that case, uh, in the second half of the flight, the VY is acting in the same direction as the gravity, and that means that the VY will begin to increase, but in the opposite direction that it was moving initially. So that's why you will see that the ball will initially travel upwards, and then it's going to come back down. So drawing the VH and VY over the flight time. So another com common merit question in projectile motion is drawing the size and direction of the VY and VH over time. Okay, so we need to uh, so linking this to forces acting. So the, once again, we we have established that the VH should remain constant. So that's both the direction and the magnitude. So VY is constantly changing due to gravity, and that is the magnitude and the direction changes. However, the, the direction changes only in the second half of the flight. So in the first half of the flight, the VY will be acting upwards, and in the second half of the flight, the VY will be acting downwards. So you know that when you're drawing vectors, so if something is always exactly the constant magnitude, therefore the size of the arrow should be exactly the same. So when you're drawing the VH, it's important that for each point of time, the VH, the VH vector should be the exact same size, because that represents that it is not changing. However, for the VY, at the start, it's going to be a large vertical component. However, over time, it's going to decrease and decrease until there is no vertical component at the maximum height. And then after the maximum height, it's going to begin to accelerate, but in the opposite direction. So it's going to increase in size, but it's going to be acting in the downwards direction instead. So putting this into perspective, I've got a diagram here. Alright, so in this case, uh, you can see that the VY starts out to be very a uh, bigger vector. As time passes on, the vertical component starts to decrease. And then at the maximum height, there is no vertical component. And as we travel back downwards again, the vertical component will begin to increase, but in the opposite direction. So notice that our horizontal component is always the same for the entire flight. So that's the length of the arrow and the direction of the arrow is always the same. So it's important that when you're drawing this, 
in the exam that you make sure that it is the same size. So when you're getting the ruler, you measure out the arrow and you make sure it is the exact same size. Okay, so sometimes the markers are really pedantic about that. So if your arrows are not the same size, then you could be uh, penalized for the question. All right, okay, so one important note that uh, you can note down in your drawing of your um, diagram is that the because the parabola is considered to be symmetrical, the vertical component at the start of the flight would be equal to the vertical component at the end of the flight but in the opposite direction. So when you're so when at the start you're gonna have your vertical component and let's say that is five centimeters long, um that is five centimeters long and it's in the upwards direction. That means at the end of the flight, the vertical component should be five centimeters long, but in the opposite direction, which would be downwards. So it's always symmetrical, so therefore the vertical component should be the same but in the opposite direction on each half of the flight. Alright, so the final part of the uh, projectile motion is finding the height at a point in time, and this is always an excellent level question in um, NCA. Right, so in order to find the height at a time t, it is important that we find out when this time is in relation to a motion. For example, if the time given occurs after the time to max height, we will need to find out the vertical distance the object has dropped from the max height. If the time given is before the max height, we will need to figure out how much the ball travels upwards in that time. Therefore, your first step should always be to calculate the time to max height or to calculate the time uh, that it takes to reach the um, the object in the first place. So, so for example, they might ask you to find oh, what is the height after 5 seconds and your time to max height might be 4 seconds. So you know that 5 seconds is bigger than 4 seconds, which means that the, uh, which means that the height is actually going to be after uh, after the max height has occurred. So you're going to find out how much the ball drops from the max height uh, and how much the ball drops from the max height <clears throat> oh sorry apologies guys so you're going to find out how much the ball drops from the max height into your position however for example if the time to max height was four seconds and uh and the time given they ask you to find the height at three seconds you will need to find out how much the ball rises in three seconds so it's a completely very different two scenarios. So it's important that you um, get this concept into uh, understand this concept. So if the time given is after the maximum height, you need to find how much the ball drops in that time period. But if it's before the max height, you need to find out how much the ball rises before it reaches the max height. All right, so if time to max height is less than the time, then you need to find out how much the object drops from the max height. And if the time is less than the time to max height, then you need to find out how much the ball travels upwards in this period. So right now we have example one. So Kevin is playing a game of tennis. He hits the ball 0.5 meters up from the ground at a speed of 14 meters per second, 54 degrees from the horizontal. Given that the net is 1.07 meters high and 11.88 meters away from Kevin, calculate calculations to determine whether the ball is successful in passing the net. So I have a little bit of a diagram here. All right, so I want you to have a go at this question by yourself. So basically what this question is asking you is, when the ball reaches the net, is the height greater than or less than 1.07 meters? If the height is above 1.07 meters, then the ball does go over the net successfully. But if the height is below 1.07 meters, then the ball will land in the net. So I want you to try to give this question a go by itself, and when you're ready, continue watching the video. Okay, so for this question, um, what I've got here is that uh, our first steps is to calculate the vertical velocity and the horizontal velocity. So our vertical velocity is sine 54 times 14, which is 11.33 meters per second. Our VH is cos 54 times 14, which is 8.23 meters per second. Alright, so we want to find uh, we, want, we want to find how long the ball how long it takes for the ball to reach the net in the first place. So we know that the VH always stays constant. So therefore we can use that the range traveled, which is eleven point eight eight meters, divided by the horizontal component is our time it takes to reach the net because our horizontal component is constant. So the net is eleven point eight eight meters away, hence the time it takes for the ball to reach the net is um Sorry, hence the time it takes for the ball to reach the net is 
uh, 11.88 divided by 8.23, which is 1.443 seconds. So now the question changes. The question is now asking you to find what is the height of the ball at 1.443 seconds. So that's the question now. All right, so now we can find the time to maximum height. That's VF equals to VI plus AT. And we find that our time is 1.156 seconds. So we now we need to compare these two times. So we need to compare the time it takes to reach the net and the time it takes to reach the maximum height. As we can see here, the time it takes to reach the maximum height is less than the time it takes to reach the net. Therefore, the ball reaches the net after the ball reaches the maximum height. So now the question changes again. The question is now asking you to find how much does the ball drop from the maximum height until it reaches the net? And is this height still higher than the net or not? All right, so now, we've, so, now, so now we need our next course of action would now be to find the maximum height. So our maximum height would be, um, we can use VF plus VI times of T divided by 2 equals to D. And we should get that our distance is uh, 6.549 meters. So that's our maximum height. So now we need to find out how much does the ball drop from in between the period from the max height to the time it reaches the net. So we're going to be using an equation of motions to find how much the ball drops in this time period. So we're going to use um, the equation that d equals to vit plus half at squared. So in this case, our vi is 0 meters per second. The reason for this is because the ball is starting out at the maximum height. And because we're trying to find the vertical distance dropped, our, verti our, our starting vertical velocity at the maximum height is 0 meters per second. Therefore, we're going to consider our initial velocity is 0 meters per second. Our acceleration is 9.8 meters per, per second per second and it's positive. The reason that it's positive is because the, the vertical component and the force of gravity are now acting in the same direction. Because now we're considering the second half of the flight. And our time is actually the time it takes to reach the net minus the maximum height. Because it's already taken 1.156 seconds to reach the maximum height. So therefore we're only, we're only going to be considering the time in between. Uh, the time it takes to reach the net and the time to max height as our time in the calculation. So 1.443 minus 1.156 that is equal to 0 0.287 seconds. So plugging these numbers into our formula, we should get that d equals to half times 9.8 times 0 0.287 squared, which is 0 0.404 meters. And therefore, the ball drops by 0 0.404 meters and the, <clears throat> the ball drops by 0 0.404 meters, um, the height at the net would be uh, the maximum height minus 0 0.404 meters, which is 6.145 meters. This is higher than 1.07 meters, hence the ball will pass the net. Okay, so one important thing I did forget to, I did miss out in the question. The question asked um, that Kevin hit the ball uh, 0 0.5 meters above the ground. I forgot to, um, uh, account for this in the calculation. So what you would do in that case would you would be adding 0 0.5 meters to a maximum height because uh, because the ball already started 0 0.5 meters above the ground. So the maximum height would be 0 0.5 meters greater than the maximum height calculated in the question. So the actually the correct answer in this case would be 6.645 meters and that's still higher than 1.07 meters hence the ball will pass the net. So I forgot to, I forgot to add the 0 0.5 meters that the ball was initially off the ground when Kevin hit the ball. Because Kevin, Kevin doesn't hit the ball like at the ground, he hits the ball um, some distance above the ground. So that was 0 0.5 meters. And I forgot to add that onto our maximum height in this question. So um, apologies for that. But uh, just noting that our final answer in this case would be 6.645 meters, which is higher than 1.07 meters. Hence the ball will pass the net. So just remember if, uh, if an object already starts an x distance above the ground, then you're going to add that x distance to the maximum height uh, in order to find um, the, the actual maximum height because it already started an x distance above the ground. Alright, so example two. On another occasion, Kevin hits the ball closer to the net. At the moment of contact, he is 3.4 meters away from the net. He returns a shot that has a velocity of 12.3 meters per second, 12 degrees from the horizontal. Does the ball pass the net in this time? So in this case, uh, in this example number two, just, ass um, just assume that Kevin hits the ball off the ground. I know in real life that doesn't make sense, but just for the sake of simplicity for this question, just assuming that Kevin hits the ball like on the, like the ball starts at the ground. So the question asks, does the ball pass the net this time? So here's another diagram. Hopefully it will assist you. 
in your calculations. All right, so here's a uh, diagram, and uh, the question asks you, does the ball pass in, that, uh, in this scenario? So I want you to pause the video and try this question for yourself. Okay, so what I have here is, uh, once again, our first step is always to find our VH and our VY. So our VH is cos 20 times 12.3 meters per second, which is 11.56 meters per second. And our VY, which, uh, not VY, uh, VV is, VY or VV, um, it doesn't really matter which notation you use, uh, unless, just make sure that the marker understands what you mean. So uh, our vertical velocity is equal to sine 20 times 12.3, which is 4. 21 meters per second. So uh, we're going to find out the time it takes the ball to reach the net, which is 3.4 divided by 11.56, which is 0 0.294 seconds. So now uh, we're going to compare the time it takes for the ball to reach the net and the time to the maximum height. So the time to maximum height would be um, 0 0.430 seconds. So in this scenario, we can see that the ball reaches the net before it reaches the maximum height. So in this case, uh, our question has now changed. Our question is now asking us, how much does the ball rise in 0 0.294 seconds? And is this height uh, bigger than or a uh, bigger than or smaller than 1.07 meters, which is the height of the net? So uh, we can we can conclude that the ball will pass the net before it reaches the max height. Well. It, it will pass the net or not pass the net. It will, I mean, it will horizontally reach the net before it re reaches the maximum height. So we're going to be using our equations of motions, which is d equals to vit plus half at squared. So in this case, our vi is our initial vertical component, which is, um, we calculated this, which is 4.21 meters per second. Our time is our time the ball it takes to reach the net, which is 0 0.294 seconds. Our acceleration is negative 9.8 because uh, in this case, we're going to be considering the first half of the flight. And for the first half of the flight, the initial vertical component is acting in the opposite direction as the force of gravity. So therefore, our, uh, our acceleration is negative 9.8, not positive. So substituting these numbers in, we should get that our distance is 0 0.814 meters, which means that the ball will rise 0 .8, uh, 0 0.814 meters off the ground after 0 0.294 seconds. So we know that this is less, uh, this is less than 1.07 meters, and therefore the ball will not pass the net. Because the one thing I really want to stress to you guys is that do, uh, you do not stop after finding the distance. Always write the concluding statement that to say whether the ball passes the net or does not pass the net. Because for example, a question might ask you, for example, oh, will the ball pass a specific uh, marker? So it's always good to finish the question by saying, oh, by answering the question. So if the question asks you, does the ball pass the net? You're going to answer with, yes, the ball passes the net or no, the ball does not pass the net. I've seen on many uh, different occasions that students are penalized, even though they did find, for example, they found the distance is 0 0.814 meters. They've done all the hard work. However, they don't have that concluding paragraph and hence they will get marked down. And that's a really shame because the hard work has already been done and it's, um, and it's disappointing for it to be marked down just because you don't have that final concluding statement. So always remember to always answer the question. So if the examiner asks you, oh, does the ball, for example, does the ball, um, does the ball pass the marker? So your answer to the question will be yes, the ball passes the marker or no, the ball does not pass the marker and give the reason. So in this case, the ball does not pass the net. That's because the height after, the height when it reaches the net is 0 0.8, uh, 0 0.814 meters. And this is less than 1.07 meters, which means that it will actually hit the net. It won't go past the net, it will hit the net and it will not go past. So that final state, concluding statement is always important. So just remember, answering the question very important okay that, that's it for all i have for projectile motion i hope you enjoyed the video and i hope to see you all in the next one thank you bye